you doing? How are you holding up running this massive organization? What are you doing to take care of yourself? Well, I'll have to say that every CEO I talk to, we ask that question and then we all laugh. And like, yeah. <laughs> you know, so crazy, exciting times. And I think the most important thing I do for myself is calendar management. Now, I know you thought I was going to say, wear my aura ring, good nutrition, get a trainer. None of those things are possible unless you manage your calendar. None. Yeah. So, you know, I have a block period. My uh, youngest daughter just started ninth grade. She goes to school. She lets me talk to her for five minutes in the morning. <laughs> and I have a half an hour block just on the off chance I get 10, but I block it every day, right? Because that's how I'm going to make sure that I can connect with her. And those things like, hey, when am I going to work out? And I'm really clear, like, when do I end my day? Can't always, can't always do it. But if I don't block it out in advance, it will never happen. So start with calendar management. And how did she affect your flight plans yesterday? Come here. Great question. I've had two uh, travel days this week. The pre-pandemic craziness is back. And in both cases, I had dinner and then I left the house. Okay. I, I would have loved to have been at the dinners for both events and I would miss dinner with my daughter. Yeah. Well, that's how you take care of yourself. So, that is. So, let people understand, just for some context, the massive size of your organization and the impact that it has on, over the world. Over 700,000 employees in 50 countries. I'm probably light. I'm sure the numbers might be more. Uh, you're certified in 11 countries with us, 14 consecutive years on the 100 best companies to work for. Recently moved to number six, the biggest move on our list. Congratulations for that. Thanks. Thank you. And number 17 today uh, on our world's best list. So help people understand Accenture. Yeah, another round of applause for that. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I have to say we debuted on the global list today, so I'm excited and uh, I'm a little competitive for my people's sake because I know it reflects that. So I, I said to, to Chuck, who I'm a big admirer of, as I said, uh, you know, we're just going to continue to learn. And one of the ways we learned is we're consultants and we hire consultants. And so <laughs> this year um, we worked with uh, Michael and his team and went from number 42 to number six in the U.S. because we did what we do for our clients. We asked the experts. And uh, so I want to thank you for really helping us do more for our people. And that's reflected in the list, but it starts with really caring about our people and being determined uh, to really be the best place to work. Mm -hmm. so. All right. And help people understand Accenture. It's pretty hard to explain, but help them understand the size and impact. Yeah, you know, I like to think about it as how it affects all of your daily lives, uh, because I think people don't always understand just how broad we are. So if any of you woke up this morning and CVS sent you a personalized message about getting a booster, we help do that because we run marketing services and have helped them uh, reach in more personalized ways uh, to their customers. Uh, when you stopped in to get your boosters, if you uh, picked up a bag of Skittles, uh, that bag has the exact number of Skittles in it that you were buying because we work with Mars, uh, which is a real digital leader, to digitize manufacturing. Uh, if you have any of you have kids who uh, or friends who are applying for federal aid, we do student.gov uh, and for the federal government for student aid. And uh, when the pandemic happened, I got calls from CEOs of companies you would know around the world thanking me because we closed the books for 70 public companies and they really weren't sure how we were going to do that entirely remotely. So it's just starting to give you a flavor of it and at the same time we touch so many companies because we're building the digital core, we're the largest uh, leader in the whole tech ecosystem, all the names that you think about. Uh, and so when we think about our people and our business, we have everything from MDs to former spies to lots of people who do technology and everything in between. So it's over 700,000 people. We added 200,000 this past year, but they're very, very different in terms of what they do and uh, who they serve. And I think you talk to more CEOs than anybody that anybody knows. And we've got inflation, 
We've got higher interest rates. We've got recession and all the other things that are going on in the world. Um, can you talk some about that and as, as you look forward, the headwinds, as well as how your role and the role of other CEOs that you talk to is changing uh, during what we're looking to face over the next few years? Yeah, I mean, I think if we take a step back, there's probably two things that we're talking to CEOs a lot about right now. So first of all, the conversation is not about how you pull back. Everyone is saying to me, you know, what are you, you know, what are people saying? And if anything, it's really about how do we go faster, either because they want to build more contingency into their business, they want to get competitive advantage because they want to invest, and more often because CEOs learned during the early days of the pandemic that a crisis can actually accelerate change. Uh, and there's a couple of things that I'm repeating over and over right now. Uh, and that is the first is, can you articulate and can your team articulate what you want to change and what they are changing? And what do I mean by that? Everybody wants to move faster. There's a lot of buzzwords out there. Digital, new ways of working. And what we're seeing is that oftentimes people cannot do the simple articulation of how have I actually changed the way I work? What have I done differently? And so that very simple question, which does not require a CEO to understand all the technology, it doesn't require them to know every part of like what should be changing, but your odometer as to are we in fact changing gets triggered really quickly if your team can't reply that yes, we're making this investment and there's something substantive. The second piece does go to talent. And uh, one of the things that we learned early in the pandemic is how core people are. Right? So it, depend, it didn't matter what the industry, uh, everyone was affected. And as we move into this next phase, the core uh, change agent is your employee. And those companies who truly are listening and attuned to their employees are the ones that have been able to move the fast. So it is not visionary CEO. That's table stakes. If you, you have to have a CEO who, who wants to change. But as all of us CEOs know, that's not enough. And the kind of change that needs to be driven right now, whether it's to handle the uncertainty or take care of the opportunity, is at such a big scale that if you don't understand the role of the employee, put the employee first, you will not succeed. And that is, I think, very optimistically, it's, it's a great conversation that we're having at the top because it has so many benefits when you think about what putting the employee first means as you think about transformational change. You know, Julie, the, um, I respect a lot of things about you. The thing I respect the most is remembering when you were running North America and you were pushing for gender equality and you were pushing so hard, I was worried about you. Meaning, I knew the global job opened up, and most times when people push for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and for equality, it doesn't help their careers. But you pushed regardless, because it was something that you believed in, and it got you the top spot. Everybody celebrated because they knew who you were. Give this woman a round of applause for pushing. Thank you. Thank you. you had a lot more to lose, and, and you didn't do it. So just want to hear some, something about you in that regard, kind of the why. Um, also, just wondered, as a woman, uh, do you feel more pressure, like I do, uh, around these topics? You know, in the second question, I would say it's uh, both yes and no. So yes, because you know, we all have our stories, right? Uh, and we can all you know, recount our stories that make us feel very responsible to not have those stories repeat for the next generations. The no is that I think there is a fundamental change in the view of diversity at certainly the leading companies because as talent has become such the competitive differentiator, and we talk about how can you access talent, how can you be a talent creator, and how do you unlock that talent? The business rationale for being diverse and inclusive is clear. And I don't feel the need to tell my personal story. I only feel the need 
to be crystal clear about the business value that Accenture has had because when we were faced with a huge transformational change back in 2013, when we told everybody the future is digital, every business will be a digital business and we were less than 20% digital and our culture was not an innovation-led culture, it was proudly we follow others, we made the decision that diversity was what we had to be more diverse, more inclusive in order to transform. And our story objectively from that moment is completely intertwined right, with our decision that diversity and inclusion was a business priority. And I think one of the things that's really come out of a tight labor market is that I have business after business who sees that we cannot be successful unless we have the widest access to people. And that means you need to be more diverse and you need to be attractive to all talent. You know, in, in terms of the CEOs that you're talking to, and um, starting to hear a lot about performance, a lot about achievement, a lot about productivity, um, and people saying things like, we're gonna increase our productivity performance 20%, which makes people fear headcount reductions and things like that. Uh, we're all reading the same kinds of things. Um, for everybody here who maybe doesn't have direct access to their CEO, what advice do you have for people in terms of uh, kind of some things they should be focusing on uh, based on the headwinds that, that you see? So one of the most important leadership qualities that I value right after always do the right thing is uh, what we call lead with excellence, confidence, and humility. And humility is all about being a learner and looking externally and not just internally. I just had a call earlier this week with the CEO who's like, can you come talk to my leadership team because we're way too internally focused. If you are really focused on how do you help your company, it is absolutely critical that you're spending time looking outside. Going back to calendar management, when you look at your calendar, how much time are you spending talking to others in the industry, talking to other professionals? Because what companies need right now are that outside in perspectives that's actionable. And I think it's really important from a career perspective and it's really important for companies to succeed right now. The second thing I would say is understanding that change management and helping lead change, it's both an art and a science. The art comes from truly understanding your company and your people and what makes it tick. So when I became the CEO in September of 2019, we were about to make the biggest change in our history. People didn't know it yet. And I knew that what mattered at Accenture was client relevance. And so before I could drive the company to a new place, all of the people, many of whom didn't know me because I'd led in North America and not um, Europe or growth markets, needed to know that whatever change we were charting was tied to understanding our clients. And so I started a simple scorecard that I shared with all of my managing directors. And it said how many client meetings I'd had that quarter and how many ecosystem meetings. That was the art, understanding how to reach our people. The science, and this is where it's super important to be asking the question, is change should not be driven by anecdotes. And so at Accenture in our own transformation, <coughs> excuse me, we use, our, we use our tools where we're establishing baselines, we're checking in, and it's not an HR activity, it is an HR-enabled business activity. And if there's one thing that you can do if you're in the middle of any kind of change at your company is to say, how are we gonna actually know that the change is happening? Because we can't wait till the program's done. And that is to be data-driven. And there's so many ways that you can be data-driven. And yet we find over and over again that transformational programs are being decided based on anecdotes and not data. And that's what I'm spending a lot of time right now in talking to CEOs about, is how to drive this next era of change where the pressures on cost and speed are even greater, is to think of it differently. It's an art and a science. Following up on a question that Ellen asked, uh, Chuck and Fran, um, well-being, 
What does that mean to you? What does it mean to Accenture? Um, you had a global leadership summit meeting, you know, top leaders uh, around the world, and you focused a lot of time on the subject. So talk about what it means and why you focused so much time on the subject. Well, and the, and the story of that is that in May, we got together our top 800 leaders worldwide. We're over 700,000 people, so it makes sense to have, you know, top 800 leaders. Every dollar of cost, every dollar of revenue, all of our people are under those leaders at the end of the day. And we did something that we've never done. Uh, and I, I've only been at Accenture since 2010, but I, 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 most of my leaders have been here more than 30 years. And that is we started that conference only about people. And we asked Michael to come, and Michael Phelps, you're gonna hear soon. And we talked about what is a real great place to work, what does it take? We asked Michael Phelps to talk about mental wellness. And after that, we gave all of our people a tool. So we said to our leaders, it matters for you and your people. And here, by the way, is an aura ring. In fact, Ellen was upset that I didn't have mine on, but it was gold, and I have not gotten around to get a silver one, and it just didn't match with the outfit, I'll be completely honest. Uh, she's like, oh my gosh, you know, Julie, you're supposed to have your aura ring. Uh, and it was so important because at that meeting, I was gonna actually ask our people who've just done a transformation and gone through the pandemic to do the next transformation, right? To, to change yet again. And I didn't feel that anyone could even hear it until they felt seen, heard. And these were our top leaders. This was not about one more thing to do for their people. This was about them. And our data showed that all of our people, very aligned to the strategy, all fearing, feeling fear and anxiety, including our top leaders. And mental well-being along with physical and financial, right, is absolutely critical to that third part of what you have to do if you want to lead in the next decade. Access talent, create talent, and unlock the potential of talent. And people could hear and think about the future differently because we started differently, and we saw them, we heard them. And it was hugely impactful, and, and I remember I had leaders, 30-year veterans of Accenture, coming up, tears in their eyes, sort of thanking me for how we'd begun. And uh, it's, it's really special, and I think, you know, you're seeing it as a competitive advantage right now. I mean, the statistics say that 80% of people looking for jobs are looking at what mental health support they provide. After financial, uh, uh, after rewards, financial rewards, well-being, and flexibility are the next two values. The business case, just like diversity, is very clear now that if you want to succeed in a tight labor market, you have to be relevant in providing a place that people feel like they have the support and well-being is an important priority for the company. You know, that session that we had, and we're you know, about to have a similar experience here today, how did it affect you? You know, uh, mental health is something that affects every family, including my own. And, you know, being able to be part of bringing um, someone like Mel Michael Phelps uh, was really important to me. And I'll never forget when I was running North America in 2015, we had the very first webcast where we talked about invisible disabilities. And a woman that I worked with for years, who'd been leading on diversity, done so much for so many people, she reached out to me after that webcast and she said, Julie, I've never shared with you, but I suffer from severe depression. And at least once a month, it is absolutely crippling. And I've had it my whole life. And thank you for enabling me to now share that. And it was so impactful because I didn't just casually know this woman. And she did so much for others. And, you know, that was for me the beginning of a much more personal journey of understanding, you know, what it, what it means to people 
whether it's your child or yourself or your partner or a friend, to be in a company that recognizes uh, how important that mental well-being is. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you ready? To, yeah. Ready to be joined by a couple of our friends? Yes. Okay, so let me announce a couple of people who are about to join us. First, we have Alan Shook, the Chief Leadership and Human Resource Officer at Accenture, uh, your partner uh, in doing remarkable things around the world. And Michael Phelps, 23-time gold medalist, mental health advocate and founder of the Michael, Helps, Michael Phelps Foundation. Please come and join us. Please welcome to the stage, Alan Shook, Chief Leadership and Human Resources Officer at Accenture and 23-time gold medalist, Michael Phelps. Got your, pe got your people here. <laughs> wow. Can't see people, Michael. You can't see people. They're out there. Trust me. Let 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 Ellen hear you. Okay. There okay. we go. Okay. I feel better now. Yes. Yeah. Good energy. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's funny. We had lunch just before this. Sat down, relaxed, spent some time together. All, you know, just a good time. Sat with Michael, caring, loving person, just wonderful. But now that it's game time, I'm intimidated. I mean, uh -oh. you know, just looking at you, it's like this little voice is in my head, like, you're going to lose. <laughs> 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 this Michael's going to win. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe bronze for you. <laughs> no. So, everyone's a winner. Yeah, every, everyone's a winner, but everyone's not really. Winner. There's some real winners. <laughs> so, you know, everybody gets a trophy after the soccer game, but there's a whole other thing happening. <laughs> uh, so thank you for bringing Michael. And Michael, thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to start with you, Michael. Um, take us back in your journey. Some might not know that you had a defining crossroads at one point in your life, in your childhood. I think you were 12 years old, three years before you debuted at the Olympics. Can you share with us what that crossroads was like? Yeah. Uh, so well, I'll take a little step back. I started to learn how to swim when I was seven years old. Uh, my, my mom put myself and my sisters in the water just for water safety. Um, and then what Michael was referring to is I, I got with uh, my coach who I spent you know, almost a little longer than two decades with uh, at the age of 11. And he, you know, he said to me, he's like, in four years, if you want, you could make the Olympic team. I was like, well, oh, that's kind of cool. Seems like a pretty fun idea. <laughs> it's what I wanted to do. Uh, that was my goal, my lifetime dream. And he said, the only way that it's going to be able to happen is if you stop playing your other sports. So I was like, great, fine, I'm in. Where do I sign? At the time, I was playing baseball, lacrosse, soccer, and I was swimming. So I'd go from one field to the next to the next and then jump into the pool. So my coach sits with uh, my parents and, and I and I was like, yeah, he could do this in four years. So then four years later, bingo. I, I did make my first Olympic team. Um, <laughs> Is that how it works, just bingo? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, yeah, I kind of okay. think, yeah, it, was, it was a bunch of days that were st stacked up on top of each other, right? Um, but yeah, so in 2000, I was, I was actually seventh at the last 50, uh, and they only take top two. So the whole last 50, I went from seventh to second, touched out the guy for third, or the, the guy who got third, went to my first Olympics. I actually didn't win. This is, we, I got a piece of paper. I didn't even get a bronze medal. Um, I got a piece of paper that said, congratulations, you participated. Um, <laughs> and that, that wasn't what I wanted. <laughs> like, let's be honest, I wanted a piece of hardware. So I used that as kind of motivation for me moving forward. Um, and kind of throughout my career, the things that didn't go as planned were always a source of motivation for me because I never wanted to have those feelings again. You know, if I'm trying to work up to, to this goal and I put this time and energy, blood, sweat, and tears into it, 
I want to accomplish it. So when I fall short, that's the first thing that I taste every single morning because I don't want it to happen again. Um, and that was kind of how my whole career blossomed and into everything else. But I don't want to get ahead yeah. of those questions. That was wonderful. That was wonderful. And you've also said before that a lot of people can make the Olympics. Yeah. I don't know about that. Okay, Why but. <laughs> well, if you do everything right, you can. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I mean, I like the spirit of it. Okay. But, um, but a lot of people can't deal with the pressure and the stress. Sure. Okay. At working at that high peak performance level for a long time. So I get, I get the point. You got a room of people super fired up about doing what they do and also making the world better at the same time. Um, so what can you share about things you've learned about building up the physical and mental capability to be a peak performer and sustain it? I mean, my, my thing is, is, so everything that I do is, is dream, plan, reach, right? I figure out a, a goal or a dream that I'm trying to accomplish, figure out little small roads and journeys, how I'm going to get there, and then try it. It's just trial and error, trial and error after that. Um, will I fall off my horse? Of course, it's not going to be easy. But I feel like for me, it was kind of just trying to control what I could control on a daily basis. And for me, that was making sure that I was ready to swim. I was, you know, and that was stretched, eat properly, recovery. So it's, what is that? Um, massages, uh, cold tubs, all of these different things. That basically was the whole reason why I was able to do what I was able to do. So for me, I feel like I was focused on all the small things, and I tried to create those habits and those routines throughout my whole career so I could not go on autopilot, but you don't have to think about all those things. So for me, I feel like throughout my career, I went from the 100-level class to the 10,000-level class because every one of those steps were climbed. I mean, I, was, I felt like they were climbed perfectly because we were so adamant on finding those little small details. Like, I think those are the things that are going to end, end up making you great and that's the thing that separates the greats from the people who are good, right? The small details. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, you did. So, Michael, <laughs> the, so there's like a lot of things to do. Did, how did you take them? Um, can you give us an example of t working on one thing? Yeah, so for me, thing. like I, so in the sport of swimming, I need to have good kick, good streamline, good technique, all of these different things. So for me... So when I was 11, my coach actually was teaching me the importance of a six-beat kick. And six-beat kicking is three kicks, one, two, three, per each single arm stroke. So he was teaching me this very important skill that I had to have throughout my whole entire career. So the very first day, he said, all right, now I want you to get in and do six-beat kick and don't drop your feet. The second you drop your legs, you're out. And I was like, what? So you're just going to kick me out? So he kicks me out the first day. I swam like 800 meters. I was out. The next day I made it 1,000, out. The next day 2,000, kicked me out. By the end of the week, I finally made it to 7,000 meters straight or 7,000 yards straight without dropping my legs. So when you drop your legs in the sport of swimming, your body position completely changes. So if I'm trying to swim as efficiently as I can every single stroke, every single day, my legs are the driving force. So ever since that very moment, I never dropped my legs for a six beat in a single practice. So imagine that done with every single stroke, every single streamline, every single um, dolphin kick, every single push off the wall, every little small detail, that's how I, that's how I approached it. Because if there wasn't, yeah. thank you. And, the, and honestly, the reason why, well, two reasons. If I wasn't going to do it, somebody else was going to. And I wanted it to be me. So for me, I, I, wanted to do thing, I, I wanted to do something that no one else had ever done in my career. So for me, I had to approach it completely different. There was no blueprint for somebody to win eight gold medals. Somebody won seven, but no one had won eight. So how do I approach that? I can't do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. I have to try something different. I have to go out of my comfort zone in order to see different results. And I think for me, like, my coach just taught me all those important things at a young age, right? So, like, goal setting. I was doing short-term and long-term goal setting. You know, I'm, I, I work in a quad every four years, right? So where, where do I want to be after year one, year two, year three, year four to give myself that chance to be great? 
I'm going to just work on it every day. And I'll be the first to admit, did I want to get out of bed every single day? No. Did I feel like a million bucks every single day? No. But as long as I was getting 10% out of that day or 50% out of that day, I was making steps forward and progress was being made. I could have skipped workouts all the time, right? But I wasn't give, if I was doing that, then I wouldn't be giving myself the best chance to grow and learn. So it was all the little small things that I could control and I tried to control them to the best of my abilities and everything else just kind of took care of themselves. You know what I just learned? A lot of people cannot make the Olympics. I, I was just going to say that. Now I know why I'm not an <laughs> Olympic athlete. Oh, my God. It just depends on the sacrifices, right? Like, I mean, for me, like... Michael Mann. But I think growing, like, growing up, like, my coach would say jump, and I would say how high. Yeah. You know, like, that's just kind of how I was. Like, I wanted it more than anything. Yeah. Um, and I think once I, you know, once I got the taste of, of whether it was a world record or a gold medal, I wanted more. Right? Like, I broke a world record at 15. My very first record, world record was six months after my first Olympic Games. And then I was like, all right, what's next? I mean, you, like, I can tell you I was almost perfect in Beijing. I broke eight, or I, I won eight gold medals. But I only set seven world records. <laughs> <laughs> That's the story of my life. <laughs> Ellen. Yes, this sir. This cat is crazy. Um, anything you'd like to add, you know, that's, that's just around peak performance and about sustaining peak performance, you know, as we're listening to somebody giving us great advice on how to break these complex things down? I mean, I, I do think the, um, the points that Michael was making about even if you don't want to get out of bed every day and do it 100%, we like to call it progress is greater than perfection. So as long as you get up, and you live your purpose authentically, and you do something that day. Um, Julie talked about one of the pillars of our talent strategy being un unlocking the potential of our <gasps> I have to take my earring off. I promised the guy backstage that I would take it off if it made noise, so I'm taking it off. <laughs> hey, Ellen, don't leave that earring there. I know. I'm not going to leave it. I was saying the same thing. My mother's <laughs> out here somewhere. She'll remind me. She'll remind me. Uh, anyway. Um, I do think that listening to, to Michael, I can't even fathom what he was talking about. I never aspired to be an Olympic athlete, but there are a few things that did resonate with me. One are micro steps or micro habits. Um, I think that is an essential part of peak performance and it's something we teach our people every day through our Thrive Global relationship. Um, and it, is, it helps our people enormously be at their best every single day. And then the, the, and maybe this wasn't your thing, but I do think that the progress is greater than perfection is important because I, I want our people to feel like they're resilient. And even if they have a day where they're not 100% or 50%, that it's okay. It's mm -hmm. okay not to be okay. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, what I, that's what I think. Mm -hmm. yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's true, right? Because you, I mean, like I said, like you're not going to wake up and feel like a million bucks, right? Does anybody in here feel like a million bucks every single day? <laughs> like, are you super excited to get out of bed every single day? Okay, I don't have to call anybody a liar. I can't even. <laughs> um, but it's so true, right? Like, I, I, I mean, I feel like if we just take little small steps, right? That's, that's really all it is. So, like, for me, that's why I say, like, I, I look at my career and I, I don't think as my career as being difficult, right? Like, yeah, did I, like, even though I went six straight years without taking a day off, I was just doing what I love to do. So for me, yeah, it was kind of easy, right? Because I was, I was competing against the clock. The goals that I was setting were higher than any other person on the planet could possibly imagine, right? So yeah, it was simple. I mean, it was. <laughs> I just had to jump on, in the pool every on. day and it wasn't do a simple. few laps. It wasn't simple. I mean, it, it wasn't simple, but you like... You had focus, intention. Yeah, I, I, of course. Like every coach. single day I went into the pool, um, you know, those two or three hours, I was fully engaged in what I was doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, like, I was a kid in a candy store. You know, that, like, that climb to the top of the mountain was one of the greatest. And, and yeah, I say the easiest because I was, I was having fun. I was engaged. I was fully on board. I wasn't one, one foot on the dock, one foot on the boat. 
I jumped on in. And if I fell, guess what? I got back up and tried something different, right? Like, again, if somebody else, if, if, if I wasn't going to do it, somebody else was. And I wanted to control that. Just like all of us can control exactly what we do every single day. You can't control the person next to you or across from you. Just what you do. So that personal commitment, do you know the source of it within you that ever tapped into it, wondered about it, why you have it? You still have it today. Oh, right? yeah, it doesn't go away. Yeah. It definitely doesn't go away. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Um, because we want it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's just, it's just doing a lot of small things right. Yeah. You know, like, and, and it's just, it's, it's um, oh my God, repetition, right? Repetition is the highest form of learning. You know, like, that's why I can say I can, I can basically, I was swimming in my sleep. Right, like, every time I got up to the block at the Olympic Games, I wasn't thinking about anything. I wasn't thinking about the lights. I wasn't thinking about my competitors. I wasn't thinking about my stroke, my start, my turns, anything. I was in the moment. And that's the only way that I could be. It's the only way I could, I, I could actually test myself and see what I could really do. Because there, there are other distractions you're never going to be able to give 100%. So, yeah. yeah. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think there really was any. Like, I mean, like I've had conversations with, you know, whether it's John Rom. Like, Rombo's been a, a, he's become a good friend of mine. And he's like, dude, he's like, how come you, Tiger, Kobe, MJ, um, Serena, like all of these greats basically say the same thing. And I'm like, well, it's real. Right? Like, I don't know, like, hard work, dedication. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, and, and, and that's why I think, you know, like, for me, like, control is so important because, like, again, like, I didn't feel great every day. My muscles were tight every day, but I still stretched every single day. You know, I ice tub, I did all this stuff to give myself that chance. That's it. I mean, like, I can't say that enough. Yeah. Right. Like I had boxes that I had to check off every day and now I have those same boxes. Right. If I'm trying to be the best dad that I can be, the best husband I can be, the best friend that I can be. If my glass isn't isn't filled, I can't fill everyone else's up. And I don't like using the word can't. Can't is one of the most negative words we have in our vocabulary. My coach actually removed that from my vo from my vocabulary at a young age, because if you say you can't do something, guess what? Yeah. You know. Right. So again, give yourself that chance. Yeah. Well, I want to talk about something that actually just makes you more amazing, okay? Because we just heard what it takes to be the GOAT, okay? For those outside the United States, it's the greatest of all time. It's, a, it's an acronym. And, um, and so, and one of the things you've been candid about is talking about your struggles, challenges, opportunities that come from ADHD. Sure. Okay? Which humanizes you. You know, so you are who you are. You just made that clear. But, hey, you're a human, too, and have these things. Um, what was it like to, fir first of all, how'd you find out? And then how'd you channel that diagnosis? Yeah. Um, so I was diagnosed with ADHD, gosh, probably elementary, middle school. And um, I, I honestly was, I, I didn't really know much about it besides that, I was just bouncing off the wall and couldn't sit still. Um, I mean, I remember in sixth grade, my teacher told me that it never amounts to anything. I was like, oh, thanks. I really appreciate you. I still remember her name, everything. She was a source of motivation. Um, but hey, for me, one of those, his name was Mr. Dimchinsky, and I'll never forget him. You have one too? He yeah. told me I was stupid. And neither will 7,000 people that are live streaming. So um. <laughs> I hope he's watching. <laughs> but I, th I think like for me when, when I found this, or when I really was able to dive into the sport of swimming I think that's what was able to kind of help me relax and focus you know like just being literally submerged in water helps me be relaxed like that's one of my greatest forms of therapy today is getting into the pool and I can literally jump in for 10 minutes and I feel incredible when I get out. Um, but I think like at that time, I, I, when, I, when I first started going to the, the nurse's office, I didn't like it. 
I didn't like getting my medication and feeling different than everybody else. Um, and I remember telling my mom that, that I wanted to stop taking the medication and she said, well, why? And I was like, well, I don't like it. I don't give her a whole explanation. I don't like how it feels, this, that, and the other. So she said, if you can focus, then we can take you, start weaning you off of it. So that's what swimming did for me. Um, and for me, I, I was just able to kind of find a rhythm and a path and, and um, I didn't let it affect me. Um, I just haven't taken anything for a long time because I don't want to and I don't need to. Um, I found other ways to kind of help me be who I am and, and like who I am, the way that I am. Um, you know, I think throughout my career, I, I kind of dove into a few uh, mental health challenges and, and struggles. And, um, you know, I, I, I compartmentalized a lot through my career. I don't think I'm going answering the question at all you asked. <laughs> so, <laughs> go ahead. I don't know if I answered your ADD, ADD question either, really. Um, <laughs> good at bridging, I guess. Uh, no, I mean, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> what is it? Quit, quit while you're ahead, right? <laughs> well, that's for you. You can quit all the time because you're always ahead. <laughs> so you've been honest, you know, after the 2012 Olympics that you didn't want to be alive. Yeah. Okay. Can you share with us more about that experience? Yeah. Asking for help in that process? Uh, so 2012, kind of after the games, I kind of went on a, down, a little downhill spiral. Uh, I retired from the sport. Um, got my second DUI in 2014. Uh, didn't want to be alive. Uh, I basically thought that me being alive was hurting everybody else around me and it would be better if I would just disappear and go away. Um, and through that process, thinking of all of that through the days afterwards, I, I um, you know, going back to it, uh, I used to take Ambien throughout my career. And, and to be honest, I'm, only ha I'm happy I only had three tablets left because I don't know if I would be alive today. Um, for me, that, those two or three days after my DUI were the scariest moments I've ever been through in my entire life. Um, but at that very moment, for me, I, I, I wanted to try to find something different, try to find an answer. Like, why am I feeling this way? I was sick and tired of just feeling, feeling like shit, basically. Like, feeling like I wanted to be six feet underground. Or just put me in a corner and give me a, give me a blanket. So for me, I kind of went on this journey of just trying to understand who I am. Um, I checked into a treatment center for 45 days, and, and uh, it was one of the scariest moments of, of my life, um, going into a spot where I didn't know anybody, I didn't know what I, what I was getting myself into, but I know I needed help. Um, so for me, those 45 days that I went through, I, I make the joke, I learned how to communicate. Um, good thing it was at the age of 30, but <laughs> at, least, at least we got there. Um, and, and for me, I think I, I was able to, to learn and understand the eight basic emotions that we all have and to talk about those basi eight basic emotions instead of compartmentalizing them up. For me, I, honestly, I, could, I, I think I could have won a few more gold medals in compartmentalization, but I, again, not something to really be proud of. So for me, it was trying to uncover and, and pull all that stuff out of me just so I could be, just so I could be myself. You know, I think for 20 years, I basically compartmentalized about 100 pounds of stuff that I was just carrying around. So for me, I went through a tr uh, the treatment center. It, it's called the Meadows. Um, there was one week of survivors. And I basically cried for a week straight, talking through the things that I never wanted to talk about, the things that I was afraid to talk about, the things that I thought I was the only one experiencing. In reality, I wasn't. Um, and I think for me, that's kind of been the coolest part of my journey since retirement. You know, understanding more and more about why and how I work. You know, what do I need every single day to be my authentic self? What does my self-care look like? All of these things are basically what I did in my career, but just on dry land, right? I'm trying to figure out what makes me me and how I can be my authentic self every single day and give myself a chance in this world. Um, I don't know. I feel like I could jump all over the place. Do you have any one spot you want me to dive, dive into? That was good. <laughs> it was good. I, I can I yeah. keep going. <laughs> that was good. Yeah. And, and, but also I think, you know, like, I'll, 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 I'll touch on, like, you know, I went to therapy and I was like, I don't, I don't want to go to therapy. I don't want to go sit on that black leather sofa. And like, everyone, that's what everyone talks about. That's all I hear. And I was kind of nervous about that. And I went into it. And I came out and I was like, whoa. Hmm. And you walk out and you feel like you're like walking on the clouds. 
Like I felt like a, I felt like a completely different person. So for me, like I, again, like I picked up these tools that I never thought I would. And now I'm able to look at myself in the mirror and like who I see, not just see that swimmer that I always saw. I get to see an, a, a human being, an, an individual, and that's the greatest feeling in the world, right? Like I, I'm not just, I, I, throughout my career, every single person is like, oh my God, I'm so happy you won 23 gold medals. I'm like, yeah, that doesn't define me though. <laughs> like, it's not who I am, that's a part of my career. Um, so yeah, I think it just, you know, going through these processes and these steps, um, becoming vulnerable, you know, like all of these things, yeah, they haven't been easy, but again, they're the reason I'm sitting on stage right now. They're the reason I have three kids at home. Yeah. So, you know, we're talking to a, you know, pretty good performer. Um, and um, you have an organization full of great performers. Um, not quite like, but you know, great performers. And um, all aspiring, all working hard, same kind of focus and dedication. Um, and uh, not everybody can be the GOAT, but people are trying, you know, in terms of, uh, of all that they do. And definitely, we all agree, um, you put the work in, you're going to get the results. If you don't, you'll probably come up short. Yeah. And, uh, but one thing around mental health, in my experience, is that, you know, leading people as well, you can see when somebody's struggling, come to the rescue, try and do things. It's real hard to see that outstanding performer who's struggling. And that's what I think yeah. about when, as I'm listening to you. I mean, my vision of you is like from what I saw on a TV, freaking perfection, yeah. okay? And so how could, never even thought about it, okay? You, uh, uh, you know, as a real person and, and a human person. So Julie, you first, um, running an organization, 700,000 people, with some amazing achievers and people. Um, how has this affected you and how you think about them? How has this affected you and your view of your people and, uh, and mental health for them, the things you can't see? Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to thank Michael for being so open. And you can see how, for a group of high performers, to see how it's okay to not be okay is like a powerful burden that's lifted, right? And Did that's that what happened. happened for your people? Actually. That is what happened for us. And we had a sense, right? We had a sense, we, we saw it in our data, yeah. right? People's fear and anxiety, including at leaders. But honestly, we, we didn't really know how important it was until we tried this. And, um, and it was super powerful. And, I think, you know, for all of us, you know, just to understand that the person, whether they're a high performer or not, on the other side of you may be going through something profoundly difficult. And you may never know. And it could be the most, the, you know, the least likely person in your mind, to your point, you know, perfection, right? And uh, it was something I, I sensed, and to see it live, it's, you know, really changed our company. I mean, we were already well down the journey of mental health. Before the pandemic, we'd actually rolled out Thrive, right? We've had 180,000 people do it. There's all this data that says that this is needed. But for me, this particular conference, and it was really the combination of you, Michael, and you, Michael, together that we realize that at the end of the day, all those stats, it's about an individual. And, um, and so I think a lot about how do we help people be empathetic? How do we help people think, oh, that person could be having a tough day, they might need help. Uh, and you know, that, for me, that leadership meeting has really changed us and, and we're you know, changing our talent strategy to think about how can we bring this message and this learning to 700,000 people? Because I can't you know, have that same experience for all 700,000 people, but it's pretty clear to me that we need to find a way to be that company and to bring these messages and this help and support. So um, 
Thank you very much, Michael. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's like you did an intervention on your company. Yes. And, um, uh, you know, what a great practice. You know, what, what an amazing practice. Ellen. And I want to just oh, recognize right for a moment no, you go ahead that um, I had this view that we needed to do something. Yeah. And it was Ellen who figured out what the what was. Because I remember I called Ellen and I said, I want to start with people. I've been listening to you. She's the one that brings the data. And I didn't know what. And um, Ellen was the one that then shaped, you know, how to do this. So um, Ellen will be eternally grateful, and there'll be many people that years to come will not know about, you know, that conference. But it was you who said, I want to bring Michael and Michael. And uh, so thank you very much. Ellen, anything about the source of that innovation, you know, for one thing, and, and also where things are now and, you, and your people as that wave continues? Yeah, I think, you know, just to build on what Julie said, it's about the human connection and creating the, the conditions for care, kindness, and connection is really kind of the place in the journey we are today. And um, it, it can be simple things, Michael. Like this, this man I work with, many of you probably have read his stuff or talked to him, Rasmus Horgard. He's an amazing um, leader around mindfulness. And he said, Ellen, it can be as simple as saying, how are you doing? really, and then waiting for the answer. How are you doing, really? Because we all get on these like Zoom calls or Teams calls or whatever they are, everyone's like, oh, how are you? And then you jump right into your agenda, but you never really pause to see or hear how the person is really doing. And I tried a little experiment a few weeks ago at our um, global management committee, which is, you know, Julie's top table. And I spent two weeks writing personal letters to each one of the members of the committee. And I told them in their letter how much, why I, not how, just how much I admire them, but why. What was it about them? And something about their families and things I admire about them. And it took a long, it, it took a lot of time and emotion for me to do that. And I had them in, in the rooms uh, when they checked in. And what it, the, the response from that was extraordinary. And what I think it showed each one of us is when you see someone as a human being first, not as an employee, not as, you know, one of Fortune's most powerful women, but as, a, as an employee, but a human being, that makes a big difference to people. And that is how you can achieve what it is we're trying to achieve one person at a time, even when there's 721,000 of us. Yeah. So let's talk about the work you've done with young people, you know, and, and talk about your foundation. Right. You know, this, you've learned all this stuff, hard to learn, you know, some of the hardest lessons and moved into giving in this way. Tell us what that's about. Uh, so uh, in 2008, uh, I had the opportunity to start my own foundation. Uh, I received a million dollar bonus from an old sponsor and instantly wanted to start a foundation. So we started with water safety. And for me, so obviously you heard, I got into the water for water safety. My mom, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I don't want to go through that again. But um, drowning, drowning actually for children under the age of 14 is the um, second highest cause of death behind car crashes. So I, I mean, with me learning how to swim, that's what I wanted to do. I was like, I want to try to change that. What can we do? Um, we've kind of transitioned into two separate components now, and, and the other one is mental health. Um, the eight basic emotions. You know, I, I, I spoke about that um, when I was in treatment, and every single morning I had to come in and look at a wall with eight basic emotions on it and tell you exactly how I felt. Sometimes it wasn't that pretty, but a lot of the times I was able to really understand why I was feeling the emotions that I was. So 
Uh, we've partnered with Boys and Girls Club and Special Olympics Worldwide um, in, what is that, 14 years? Uh, is that right? Am I doing the math right? Close enough, not 14 years, close enough-ish, you know the deal. Um, we've taught over 30,000 kids to be water safe. Um, this is something that, that, that is exciting, but there has to be more. Um, and, and as we've seen throughout the pandemic, clearly mental health is on the rise, right? Like for me, I, I believe that uh, loneliness has struck into people's lives more than it ever has. And loneliness is the number one cause of depression. So um, these are things that, that I want to get out in the open and I want to talk about and I want to try to fix. Um, they're the reason why I'm still alive and I'm still here to share my story and I just want to help. Um, you know, I, I understand what it feels like to go through difficult times and struggle and um, breaking through barriers and I want to give everyone, everybody else that opportunity. Um, so I've, I have a, a lot of goals with my foundation, one of them I'll share. Um, I'm trying to get into, there's 5,000 boys and girls clubs in the country, I'm trying to get in every single one of them, a swimming pool in every single one of them, uh, which is if anybody knows anything about swimming, that's going to be really hard, but I'm going to do it. Uh, I'm going to find a way to do it. Um, again, because I, I want to give a kid hope and a chance and <laughs> just to go out and do whatever they want. Like, I mean, for me, as you heard, I was a kid in a candy store my whole entire career. Uh, well, 95% of my career. Um, so I, I want somebody else to have that same opportunity. To dream of something bigger that no one else has ever dreamt of. And just go out and who cares what happens? Just go out and have fun. Um, you know, I think that's, that's just something for me that's been super exciting. And, and, and to see kids overcome obstacles and boundaries, um, little things that maybe have been holding them back. And they have more confidence when they're able to get through these things. So for me, it's, it's just, it's a dream come true to see a smile on a child's face um, when they've made a breakthrough. Uh, and, and like with my kids now today, uh, I have three kids and, and uh, they do this thing called a lion breath. So a lion breath is just a deep inhale and they get to roar as loud as they possibly can. And that kind of helps them calm a little bit. And then we can talk about the emotions that they're feeling. And some of those emotions for my kids are pretty wild and pretty big. Right? They carry a lot of big emotions. So trying to help them talk them through that. You know, for me, I've been able to now see, you know, Boomer will come up and be like, Daddy, I'm not, like, I don't feel that great today. I'm feeling a little sad and this is why. You know, as a six-year-old, I never would have ever said that or thought about saying that. So for me, it's, it's just incredible to see people being in touch more with their emotions and their feelings to allow themselves the chance and the opportunity to be the best version of, of, of themselves. Um, you know, Michael, as you've got more insight into yourself and more insight into mental health in general, a global crisis. Uh, for sure. Um, have you learned things to help all of us learn what not to assume? Not to assume? Yeah, about people with mental health, um, you know, that have anything like that. Um, I mean, honestly, what, what, what I've heard from, from both of you guys up here talking about that, talking about it in the, in the workforce, right? It's just asking if they're okay. Like, that's so, it's so important. It's so huge. Honestly, like, that for me, I, I have a few friends who in a million years, like, if I told you their names, it's, it's just cre like crazy how worlds work and come together. But I have a few friends that just randomly will check in with me, right? And it's just like, hey, how you doing today? Like, I haven't heard from you in a while. Everything okay? And I'm like, oh, whoa, like, I see him on TV all the time. Like, why is he texting me? Like, but because they care and they want you to be okay. And, and honestly, those little text messages that I get from time to time, no matter what state I'm in, it's so, it, it means the world to me. Um, and, and again, like going back to my coach, like my coach telling me I can make the Olympic team, that was showing that he cared and he believed in me. And that was it. That was, that was why I said, all right, let's go. So I think it's just like something like that, just saying hello to somebody goes such a far way. Um, if somebody likes hugs or f offer a hug, a high five, whatever it might be, uh, I think that's just something that, that will help people lower their guards a little bit. You know, like when, when I was at the Olympic Games in 2016, I basically saw it written across people's foreheads that they were struggling. And that's why we, that's why we um, created the documentary Weight of Gold. You know, being able to just lay it all out there raw and in your face and, and it's real, right? And through the pandemic, we noticed it. We saw it firsthand. What have you found, you know, just 
you know, I know you just can't show up in a hotel exercise room and, you know, kind of. Do oh, I do. And I put okay. my headphones on, and if anybody sees me in there, I am not very friendly. In the gym. <laughs> <laughs> do not come and talk to me if I'm working out. <laughs> Squattober. Yeah, Squattober. We're in a big Squattober this month. All right, all right. Well, you know, just on the way here, where we moved through the back of the kitchen yeah. and et cetera, and this woman, like, wouldn't let you get in the, <laughs> the elevator. She was like, yep. do you know who you are? <laughs> you know, and so <laughs> it was a whole, she, and she literally, she was like, Blessing bless everything. you. She yeah. blessed you. Yeah, she Aww. blessed me. Like, okay, that's that. really something. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but just, like, seeing that. And um, it, it made me think about, uh, you know, your life, your reality as a human being, as a father, as a husband, as a teacher, a, a, as a leader, all the things that you're trying to do, and yet knowing that you can wake up and the cloud is there. What have you learned about that day? Waking up and the cloud is there. What have you learned that can help us? Uh, for me, it's, it's what makes me me, you know? like. It's, it's so, if I'm in a bad mood or if I'm in a dark spot, like, I've been able to figure out whether that's a workout, whether it's jumping in the pool, whether it's quiet time by myself, right? Like, there are days where maybe I'm in a dark space and there's a lot of loud noises going on in the kid, from the kids, right? Because they're, they're never that loud normally, right? There's no yelling and screaming going on. But there are times, like, my, where my wife will just, she'll see me step out of the room because that might be something that I need. You know, so I think for me, I, I've been able to, so again, I work out six or seven days a week. Um, I, I wear a whoop, so I know what all of my scores, my, 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 my sweet spot, so you will, like I know where I live with sleep, recovery, all of that stuff. Um, I think it's just finding something that makes you happy, right? Like self-care is something that's so important, and that's something that, that I think for me, I was forced to learn to do during the pandemic because we were kind of sitting in our, own, in our own stuff, right? Like we basically sat around and had to live with everything that we were going through. So for me, I took that as an opportunity to set a routine and to try to get into that and, and to not quit, right? Like if a day is going to be hard, fight through it. Like what do, what do I have to do to put one foot in front of the other? Um, so yeah, it's swimming, it's sleeping, it's all of the normal things, like, but, I mean, I, I say that, but it's the same thing that I've done for 20 years, right? Like, it's, it's just what makes me me. And my wife always says this, if my glass isn't full, I can't fill my kid's glass up. I can't fill my wife's glass, my, my wife's glass up. So, you know, self-care is just something that, that has really taken over me um, because I want to be the best, my, my best self. Um, yeah. I want to live in the moment as much as I can, right? So, um, again, those little check marks, I journal a ton. Right, like for me, and, and I even journal on the days that don't look very pretty because I want to know why. I want to know why I had a bad day. Did I have not have enough sleep? Did I not eat enough? Did I not drink enough water? Um, did something trigger me? You know, so, because that's how I'm going to learn and that's how I'm going to be able to handle that situation long, later. So I feel like just for me, it's getting stuff out into the open and, and trying to be my authentic self. Um, so it's, yeah, again, workout, it's just simple stuff. I, we live in an overcomplicated world. I want to I simplify things as much as I possibly can. Um, so my, my routine is the same thing every day. I wake up, the boys get out of, at, at a, out of the house and go to school. I work out, um, I work. Um, if I need to go hit golf balls and escape, I'm obsessed with golf, absolutely obsessed. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I just, you just, find little things that work. I feel like I've tried so many different things. And again, that's why I tried therapy. That's why I tried to go, you know, to check myself in a treatment center, right? Like I, I didn't know what was going to work. I didn't know how to ask for help. I just did it. And whatever happened, happened. And you just kind of maneuver through that. You know, I, and I'll be the first one to admit, I was afraid to ask for help because I didn't want somebody to say no. But I also learned that people might say no, and that's okay. They might not just be able to help. They just might not be able to help you in that exact moment. And, you know, like, it's a different topic, but I'm going to go there. Because so, like, for me, like, my, my wife and I, you know, obviously my wife holds space for me, right? So if I'm going through some kind of difficult time, she always holds space for me. There are people that I go to that sometimes will tell me they are not able to hold space for me at that time. And that's okay. Michael, what so does that mean, hold space? Hold space. So 
hold space so if I'm going to unload on you, so if I'm going through a dark time or a difficult time, I don't know what to say, I don't know how to say it, and I just throw it all at you, somebody might say, you know what, I'm in a difficult time too. I might not be able to handle that right now, like, and that's okay. So, and I think that, like, for me, that went hand in hand with, with asking for help because I didn't want that fear of rejection. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're saying your wife pretty much will, okay, let me have oh, it. Oh, all the time. Yeah, and it's the same thing for me. You know, like, and, and, and that's how we've been able to work as well as we have, and especially through the pandemic. You know, I think I mean, we, we went through some challenges and, and we're definitely tested, but I think the reason why, or the, the reason that we have such a good communication level is we've worked on it, and that was the only way we managed. I mean, I, was, I had some scary moments during the pandemic, and so did she. But we both were able to take care of ourselves and take care of each other and help each other through that process. I hope yeah, everyone's we'll taking these lessons away. So self-care, it's not yeah. something to feel guilty about. It's something we all need. Yeah, don't feel guilty about it. You need it. We have to have it. Every single human being in this, in this room needs it. Know who your person is. Mm -hmm. Your wife is your person, so find your person. And um, three, it's know that you might get rejected, but that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, we, we keep, because like what, like what we're all saying, right? There are other people that are going through yeah. other things that we might not know about. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think we should spread more love. We should be with you or, or support one another through absolutely everything. And I think we'd all be a better place, right? Love that. Spread more love. <laughs> yeah. I also want the room to give a round of applause to your wife. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I got lucky. Yeah. So, um, thank you. And, you know, Michael, the... Um, we are so glad you didn't do what you thought about doing. Um, you know, so it's like you've had a life of miracles. Thank you. So this one, though, is a benefit to all of us. Um, so we're glad you're here. Um, it, it's, uh, as Sent Marshall earlier today would say, it's a blessing that, that you're here. Mm -hmm. um, your families, glad that you're here. Those of us who suffer and have people around us have hope because you're here. So please get up on your feet and give this man a thank you for what he's done today.